Hey, welcome, and we'll talk about sound waves today. I uh, figure the video needs a decent introduction, anyway, since I'm putting zero production value into this. Um, it's mostly up there so that you see, and, and especially if you miss class, and especially this class, I go through a bunch of stuff that you're going to need. Now, if you took XGAL with me last year, I went through a bunch of this already. If you took XGAL with me the year before that, I did not. So, uh, uh, so if you took XGAL down here and we did uh, molecular cloud collapse and gene stability and it was kind of painful and long, we're going to do that again right now. Um, it's going to be long and painful. Uh, if, uh, I don't know, I think I probably, I might have, I don't know. These are, these are topics that I, that I bring up all the time because this is one of the places in, as you're learning physics, as you're reading physics textbooks, there is a sentence that says, uh, something like now we linearize and then it so they write down a huge block of equations and they say we linearize and they write down another huge block of equations that is seemingly unrelated to the first one and they have skipped pages and pages of algebra but it's pages of algebra that all looks the same and once you've done it a couple of times you can just do it in your head and it's really not that bad but you got to learn the technique first so that's part of what we're going to go through today so uh let's see so today um i have uh oh uh -oh. Damn it. No, no, there you go. These are all my these these are my notes from last week. That packet of stuff. This is my today's notes. I can just wing it. It's not a real big deal. I just hate being disorganized. Uh, all right. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to do pipe flow real fast. So this is Poisoy. 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 Nobody, nobody speaks French. Anyway, this guy's. This guy's flow. Okay. So this is this is basically two things. It's. No, um, oh, actually, let me let me stub out what I'm going to talk about today. So, so I'm going to do pipe flow. Just because it's important and it's a really useful application of viscosity. Um, and then I'm going to move into chapter six and I'm going to start with thermo. And I'm going to cover, uh, I'm going to spend a good long while on that first page that he just kind of blows through. And if you've taken thermo recently, that first page wasn't too bad. And if you haven't, it was completely incomprehensible. So we'll talk about thermo and I'll give you all the thermo that you need. And then then we're going to spend time talking about linearization and stability. Well, I'm not actually going to get to stability today. I'll talk about it. I'll show you where it is. But we're not going to talk about anything that's actually unstable. Um, uh, and for you analysis. So we'll talk about linearization and Fourier analysis, and then we'll talk about sound waves. It's all like two pages in the book, but I'm going to spend all day on it. Uh, because, because the book does the same thing that everybody else does. He says we linearize and we get this thing. Um, he doesn't spend a ton of time on it. So um, OK, so Poisoy, Poisoy flow. So this is important because it's everywhere. Right? Flow of water through a pipe, pretty common process. You're doing it right now. There's, there's fluid flowing through the pipes in your body all right now. Um, all of the blood, all of the goo, all of the stuff and all of the tubules, all are fluids flowing through tubes. Um, now, would you say that the blood flowing through uh, the capillaries in your hand, is that high Reynolds number flow or low Reynolds number flow? Well, V is small, L is small, everything is small. So the Reynolds number is really small. Uh, because remember what the Reynolds number is. The Reynolds number is LV over nu, so it's velocity over viscosity. Uh, oh, RE. Okay, so 
So I put some pressure gradient across the pipe. So we say the pipe has a length L, and we have a pressure gradient across it, delta P. So the pressure is higher here than it is over here, and stuff flows through. Yay. So the question is, uh, how, how much flux can I get through my tube? So really, uh, I want um, mass for time, right? I want a flux of fluid. So I want to know how much flow can I get through this pipe. One of the important things about this pipe is the flow is laminar. That means it's smooth. That means it's got low Reynolds number. That means it's not turbulent. It's not doing chaotic nonsense. There's a couple assumptions that get broken as soon as we invoke tur as soon as turbulent processes uh, show up. Namely, that the flow is all in this direction. We're going to assume the flow is all in that direction, and the other directions are are not uh, uh, excited. Kind of fascinating. If you start blowing on a pipe really slow, the flow is all in that direction. And if you blow really hard through the pipe, then you'll get flow this direction. Weird. Chaos is a problem. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So let's just, so laminar flow, smooth flow, everything is going in that direction. What are the boundary conditions? At the wall. Velocity is zero. Velocity is zero. So, so we've got VZ, we've got VR, We'll have a V theta, but we're going to ignore it. We'll just pretend that V theta is zero for now. Um, uh, but we've got a radial and a Z velocity. So at the wall, at R equals, oh, we need a name for this. Let's call this A. R equals A. What? VZ equals zero because of the no-slip condition. And VR equals zero because it's a pipe. You can't go through the wall of a pipe. Um, uh, okay, so we write down obvious Stokes. dV, dt. Actually, I'm going to write it down up here and kind of a little. Can you see it up here? dV, no, that's too small. Write down here. dV, dt plus v dot grad. V equals minus 1 over rho grad P. I skipped a step. I said, I know how to do that. And then I look at it and I'm like, did I have that one? Okay, so we're going to assume that we're in steady state. This, this, I just forgot to write down the assumptions. So if we're in steady state, so dV dt is zero. We're just going to throw that bit out. Yeah. Why is that the case? Because I'm assuming that I turn on my faucet, water comes out, water just comes out. Okay. So we're just assuming that the flow, we're away from turning on or turning off the flow. That's really the important question. Because that's comp more complicated, because then you got to deal with the sound wave propagating. So we'll just say the water is flowing and it's not changing very much. Then we got this V dot grad V term. And what is that? So this, uh, let's see, we did this. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, grad P becomes minus one over rho dP dl, which is just, we're going to call this delta p over l. And then the right-hand side, oh, I'm sorry. Jesus Christ. Normally, I focus better before I start talking. Sorry. Back up a little bit. Erase a couple of pages of this. I've got to do this again. Though. This is the bit that I said. I know how to do this, and I skipped it, but I totally spaced. dv dt plus v dot grad v equals minus 1 over rho grad p plus nu del squared v. That's the term that I need. That's the term that does stuff. Okay, let's talk for a second. So we're going to send 
the time derivative to zero by saying that we're not really, oh, thank you. We're not doing anything that's changing with time. Flow is flowing through the, through the pipe. This term, let's talk about this term for a second. So, we have VZ times DV DZ. This is one of the terms. We also have VR dot D by DR D, and we have V theta dot D by D theta, but we set V theta to zero, so we'll just kill that term. And we're gonna assume that the VR term is zero as well, because it's zero here, and it can't be like building up in the middle, right? And the gradients along of VZ along Z also have to be zero. Otherwise, stuff bunches up. That make sense? So if VZ is changing along Z, then I'll have a pile up somewhere. Or it'll get thinner somewhere. So we'll kill that term too. Does that make sense? Now, another way to say this is this is all the time derivative. So I say I'm in steady state. I get to throw the whole thing out because this is the time derivative. But you can do it component by component, too. And the reason I did that is because this term is hairy, and talking about the components is useful. But we're going to throw them all out. So the right-hand side goes away. Now what's on the left-hand side? Left-hand side goes away. What's on the right-hand side? We've got grad p. Let's get rid of this row, minus. And we're going to call this mu. Oh, here's the thing that I forgot to talk about. It's minor but it's one of those things that is useful to have explicitly stated. Nu is viscosity. Mu is kinematic viscosity, and it's just nu over rho, or nu times rho. Mu is like an M. It goes with the momentum, so there's a rho on it. Nu looks like a V, it goes with the velocity. There's not a row on it. Does that make sense? So mu and nu are related just by the density. And it's really, density is basically constant for most of the things that we do until like five minutes from now, density is constant. Um, so del squared V, we're in cylindrical coordinates, so we'll just write this down. This is mu times uh, 1 over R D by dr of r d v z d r no d v d r uh, equals let's call this delta p over l let's get all of the stuff to the right hand side so that we can just integrate so i get d by dr of r times dv dr equals uh, minus, uh, minus r times delta p over l times mu. Then we need to integrate once. So now I'm just going to integrate this thing twice. And do I feel like doing that? No. We're just going to jump to the end. So this is the radial component, the radial derivative of the z component. Because we're looking at shear from this, the, the middle of the pipe where the flow is big between and the end of the pipe where the flow is small. So we have this shear profile, right? And I can flow in the middle, but I can't flow at the wall. So what does that look like? I take this and I integrate it twice, and that's just some calculus that's not very interesting. I'm staring at it to see if there's anything useful that I want to say about that calculus, but I don't think so. You just integrate it twice and you're left with one fourth delta p over l times mu times r squared evaluated at a and at zero. So that's what you get after integrating this a couple of times equals vz of r. So 
VZ equals oops, come on, one quarter uh, times delta P over mu L. Why is this a quarter? Well, because I get a two from integrating this once. This is an R that brings down a one half. I got another R that brings down another one half. And then I get my four. So this four comes from integrating twice. And I've got an R both times. Um, uh, and then A squared minus R squared. So this is what the profile looks like. It's a parabola. So you can say that the velocity is zero here, a maximum at the center, and zero at the edge. So we have this, we have an equation for this. Then the next question that you can do is say, okay, what is the actual mass flux? So the, the mass flux, we'll call this Q, this is This is the integral over the area, dA, of rho times v. Rho v is the flux, and I just want the total flux in mass per second. So I just integrate by the area, integrate over the area. And then I integrate this, and I'm left with uh, pi over 8 times delta p over mu L times A to the 4. OK, so what does this tell us? This tells us a couple of things. The, re the reason that this is useful is, one, if you have a pipe and you want to know how big you need to make the pipe so that the flow stays smooth. So if I make, the, if I make A small, then uh, the flux that you get through the pipe is not as big. Um, if make A big, it goes up like the fourth power. So the area only goes up like the square of the radius. The flux you get through goes like the fourth power of the radius of your pipe. Yeah. Why do we give it as A, four, a to the fourth over A? Uh, oh, there's not an A. There's not an, a, there's not an a, a to the fourth over A. There's an A to the fourth over, what do we have? There's a four, a mu, and an L. So this is the length of the pipe, and this is the viscosity. Right? You said it was pi over eight. Uh, oh, pi over eight, maybe. Yeah, there's another two in there. Yeah. So why does this go like the fourth power when it's when the area just goes like the square power because of this parabolic shape of the velocity in the middle? When I make it bigger. I lose, I have more of the bulk that's not stuck to the wall. So as you make the pipe bigger, your surface to volume changes. Another thing this is useful for is if I want to measure the viscosity of a liquid. If I want to measure the viscosity of a liquid, I just get a bowl of that liquid and a little tube coming down the bottom of that bowl and I measure how fast it comes out. And then I just invert this. I get I can measure the mass flux rate just by measuring how much stuff I get in a second. And then I can do this. I know what the pressure difference is between the top and the bottom. I can get what the viscosity of the liquid is. So you just measure how fast something flows down the pipe to figure out what the viscosity is. Uh, okay. Does anybody have any other questions on this? Um, that's all I'm going to say about that for now. And I'm going to move on to this other fun stuff. So first, we're going to talk about thermo. And then we'll talk about uh, sound waves. Uh, let's see. I sometimes I send out a survey before class so that I can know who took what, uh, and I didn't do that this time because the last couple of years everybody's been very homogeneous. But like half of you guys have seen thermo, right? I have seen thermo before. Two of you guys have seen thermal. Okay, never mind. No, so most of you have not seen thermal. So that, that answers that question. I will talk. It uh, doesn't really change. It just changes my, my empathy for you guys who are going to be a little bit bored hearing this stuff again. Um, not a lot bored. I'm a very enter entertaining speaker. Okay, so PV equals 
NRT. NRT. So that, hopefully, if that's not familiar, just stop me and I'll talk about it. But I figure everybody's seen this, yeah. Um, so pressure times volume is equal to the number of moles times R times T. Now, I rarely use this formula. I usually use big N and K T, where this is the number of particles. I'm a physicist. I'm an astronomer. I'm not afraid of gigantic numbers. So I'm OK with using the number of particles here and using Boltzmann's constant instead of the gas constant. What's the relationship between Boltzmann constant and the gas constant? There are two answers. Avogadro's number. Because this is in moles, and this is in particles. So how many particles are in a mole? It's Avogadro's number. You can also say the mass of the proton, because the mass of the proton is 1 over Avogadro's number. Um, so, and that's what the book does. He calls, he calls R k over m. So this isn't useful because I never deal with volumes. Volume is, the volume is about the boundary. And I don't care about the boundary. I care about what's going on inside the boundary, because my boundary is 40 light years away. So the volume I don't care about. We were going to rewrite this as density. You just move volume to the other side, and you get P equals R times rho times T. I snuck a mass of the proton in there. I started with this side, and I stuck the proton mass in there, and I get this one. Let me follow that. Can you say that again? Yeah. Okay, so this is a number. This is in mass per volume. So I need another mass in there. To make because this is a number and this is a mass, so this is the so I take this and I divide by the proton mass in this term, and this becomes um, the density. Does that make sense? So we've got pressure is R times density times temperature, and this is mass density now, which is what the thing that we care about. Uh, okay, internal energy. For an ideal gas, I'm just going to state this without proving it, is CV, CV is the, is the specific heat at constant volume, times the temperature. So the internal energy in an ideal gas is just the specific heat times the temperature. Think about that. Specific heat is in energy per temperature. So I just multiply by temperature and I get energy, right? For an ideal gas, that works because there's no intermolecular bonds that you have to worry about. If I had intermolecular bonds, then that's another additional energy that I have to deal with. And I can't just say that the energy is all the temperature. But I get to say the energy is all the temperature. And CV, we know what it is. But I don't care what it is right now. There's another function, another, another variable called gamma, which is, there's a couple different ways to write it down. It's CP over CV, this is the specific heat at constant pressure divided by the specific heat at constant volume. That's not very useful for us today. We need, we need to know this as R over CV plus 1. Okay. This is a gamma is a constant that describes how squishy the gas is. So it describes how many degrees of freedom a particle in the gas. Um, uh, yeah, that's what I say about it. So gamma is, and I'll show you where gamma shows up. Gamma is something useful. So CV is the specific heat. Gamma is related to the specific heat by R. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. So we start with the first law. The first law says heat flow is energy change from the internal energy. This is the actions of molecules. So what does a molecule think its energy is? And that's both its kinetic energy, but also its, also its, its sticky energy to the guy next door. So maybe if there's intermolecular forces, that all will be uh, uh, in here. But this is just what the particles feel. This is what the molecules know about. P 
plus the configuration. So this is how are those molecules arranged. This is P times dV. So a little tiny bit of heat flux flowing out of something gives you a little bit of energy change and a little bit of work. So this is energy and this is work. So now if you remember from hydro, if you took it with anybody other than Paul Cottle who skips this bit, um, and I'm going to make fun of him for it because it's a drag that he skips this bit. Uh, if you have the pressure volume curve in uh, and you've got a gas with some certain pressure and volume, if I take it to a, say, lower volume and higher pressure, then I have to do work on the gas. And the work is equal to the area under this curve. Does that make sense? You guys remember doing that your freshman year a little bit? No? I don't remember doing that. I remember finding the area under PDV curves. Kind of. Oh, all right. I don't need you to do that. That's just what I want you to know about. So what is this? This is, I have a bottle. So I have to say this side moves. It's got some pressure in it. This pressure is pushing on this wall. If I then move the wall, the pressure times A is a force, and it moves by a distance dx, F delta x, X is work. I think I'm going to give up on this little shard of chunk. It's too little. We'll use this green one. Okay, so pressure pushes pushes the wall a little bit. It does work. <clears throat> so PDV is just like FDX. So this is just force times displacement. Okay, what are we going to do with this? Now. The way I wrote this is kind of special for thermo. I mean, other things will do thing. Other fields of physics will talk about things in this way as well, but thermo is particularly bad for it. So this dQ is a infinitesimally small amount of heat. This is an infinitesimally small amount of internal energy. This is an infinitesimally small amount of work. It's not really a differential equation because there's no derivatives. I just said tiny little things. Um, so that's useful. The other useful thing we need to know is that, okay, so first, first of all, we'll talk about this in a second. The other thing we need to know is TDS equals dQ. S is entropy. T is temperature. This is a formula that I don't think that I have really fully gotten my head around with why this is the way it is. I probably need to do that. I'm only, maybe I'll see if I can teach thermo so that I can understand this better. Um, the best way to learn a topic is to teach a graduate level course on it, because then you better figure it out really fast. Um, not the best way to first learn a topic. Um, okay, so TDS, this is entropy and this is heat flux. So I can rewrite this equation into this TDS equals dE plus P dV. So what this tells me is that a little bit of, of change in the internal bits changes the entropy of the object. So heat flux and entropy are related this way. And my first law of thermodynamics I can write now, and I get the TDS equation. Yeah. Can you define what entropy? Um, let me think about how deep down that rabbit hole I need to go. I, I didn't think about that question. Um, so in one way, it's a measure of the disorder in the system. Um, uh, but that's not a way that you can see from anything that I've said here. Um, yeah, let, but let's go with that for now. So entropy is a measure of the disorder in the system. So if I have a system that where all of my things are nicely, neatly laid up, uh, arranged, that's a thing that has a low entropy. If I have something that has 
uh, a lot more chaos and disorder in it, that's the thing that has higher entropy. Why is that? Um, because there are more ways to be in that state. So it's kind of a measure of the rareness of the state that you're in, if that makes any sense. So how unique, how special is that state? Lower entropy states are more special because they're harder to get to. Higher entropy states are in a way less special. There's more ways to have a higher entropy state. I'm gonna come back to that. Um, I'm going to answer your question tomorrow, Thursday. Um, uh, so, but the thing is, if you come back, you always need to come back to here because entropy inside a thing and the heat flow across its wall are super related. So it doesn't really matter how much entropy you have in a lot of senses, but what matters is how much entropy you lose or gain at a particular point in time. Uh, entropy is not a thing that you can really measure. There's not a meter for entropy. Um, uh, okay, what do I do with this? Because I'm going to go somewhere, and I don't want to spend all my time. We're not going to really spend a ton of time with this uh, with this equation. Basically, from here, it's just a little bit of calculus to show a useful result that we're going to need. I'm going to spend some time on this useful on on getting this result though, because I do like it. So, okay, DE. Let's first we're going to divide by. The proton mass and make everything per unit volume. Now I'll make a little s and a little e and I'm going to rewrite this as 1 over rho. I'm going to continue writing this as an s though and not that scripty s just because it's easier. So now it's per unit mass. I didn't actually change anything that you care about. I just made it a little easier. So de, let's just start plugging in things that we know. We know some stuff about internal energy and we know some stuff about pressure. Let's get rid of some variables because there are too damn many variables in this equation. So DE, so I've got one, two, three, four, five variables. Let's get rid of some of them anyway. So DE is CV DT. I mean it's D CV DT, but CV is constant so it comes out. This one d1 over rho, we've seen this already, this is 1 over rho squared, you get a minus sign, d rho. Does this make sense? I'm just taking the derivative with respect to nothing, which you can do. That's what I did. So we got a minus p over rho squared times d, uh, d rho. Okay, p, let's get rid of some more stuff. P equals R rho T. R rho T. Nice. And this is a CV. Okay, now I'm going to divide through by T. And I got DS. So the change in entropy is CV over T times DT minus R times rho. My t goes away. Oh, hey, let's do a little bit of this algebra. My t goes away. R cancels with R. So this is just big R over rho, d rho. Now this is a thing I can solve because I can just integrate. What is the integral of p? What is it? R over rho d rho, the integral of this is the natural log of rho. So this is p log rho. Uh, r. That's not a p, that's an r. can't read my own handwriting. Similarly, this one is going to turn into cv, d, uh, CV log t. So this becomes cv log, so S is CV log T minus R log rho plus S naught. And you gotta have your constant of integration. Though you never know actually what S naught is. It's never a thing you know. It's weird. I don't think I understand entropy as well as I want to. I mean, I understand it well enough to talk about it, but 
Are you guys familiar with the with the verb to grok? That means to really understand deeply. It was invented in the 60s by a sci-fi writer. Um, but it's a super useful word. I do not grok entropy the way I grok other things. So S is CV log T minus R log rho. We can make this simpler. Let's put this upstairs. And so we get a log T to the CV minus log rho to the R. I'm just going to think about these two terms for a second. We'll come back and stick it in somewhere else in a second. Oh. And I have a fresh board. It's not a fresh board. I should come here and plan ahead and then it looks cooler. So I've got log t to the cv minus log rho to the r. Okay, now this is just a little bit of algebra. It's nothing very interesting in the rest of this, but I'm going to go through it. I, what do I do? when? How do I get these divide. simpler? Just divide. So you get log t to the cv over rho to the r. Okay, T equals P over R rho uh, So we'll stick this in here and I'm going to do this in a little weird way log T over rho to the R over CV Oops. P over R rho the CV. I did a little bit of the algebra, so now I'm raising everything to the CV. And this is R to the CV, or rho to the R over CV. I got a rho here. I'm left with log P over rho to the R over CV by plus one plus log of R, but I don't care about that. It's just a constant. I'll pack that into the other constant that I don't care about. So this R goes away because it's a log. And I can, logs kill constants. It's a really nice thing about logs. And I got what this is. This is just gamma. So now let's put in the rest of the equation. S equals the log equals, oops, this is all to the CV. So we'll bring the CV down. Is CV times log of P over rho to the gamma plus S naught. I don't care about the S naught. Okay. So entropy, entropy is related to heat flux. Think about it that way. It's kind of a record of all the heat flux that something ever experienced, maybe. We'll come back to entropy, but entropy is equal to the log of P over rho. So then I know that if ds dt equals zero, then I can take the derivative of this derivative of this with respect to t is just this crap over 1 times the derivative of this. So d this, if the derivative of this is 0, then the derivative of this inside stuff is also 0. The outside stuff is 0 too, but the inside stuff is 0. So I can say that this implies that p over rho to the gamma equals constant. This is the important bit that we'll need. I'm going to circle this till it gets funny. This is very important, okay? So in an adiabatic process, p over rho to the gamma is a constant. You just saw how to do it. You start with the TDS equation. So this is just the first law of thermodynamics. I'm not going to make you do any of this stuff, but I want you to see it. So this is important. Okay, what is an adiabatic process? An adiabatic process is one in which the entropy doesn't change. So we're going to talk about adiabatic processes a lot. So when I have, say I've got a sack of gas, and I, and it's made out of, uh, say this is a bottle of gas that's made out of thin aluminum, and I'm going to squish it slowly. As I compress the gas, what does it do? Push back. Pushes back. That's a good answer. What else does gas do when you compress it? Heat up. It heats up. So when you squish a gas, it gets hotter and it gets denser. But if I do it slowly and the heat can all leak out, 
then I'm at the same temperature the whole time, and I can have an isothermal process. If I take my, if my bottle is made out of thick concrete, and I smash it really fast, then the heat can't escape. And then I have an adiabatic process. So adiabatic means a couple of things. Literally and, and most accurately, it means no entropy change. That's really what it means. But it also means no heat flow. Because T, TDS is DQ. So heat flow is entropy change. So if there's no entropy change, there's no heat flow either. Does that make sense? Also, it means P over rho to the gamma equals constant. Means that P is a function of rho only, not a function of anything else, not a function of temperature independently. This P is a function of rho and T. This P is a function of only rho. When it's adiabatic, the temperature doesn't matter. P over gamma, rho to the gamma matters. So those are the important bits about adiabatic. I'm going to write that down over here. Adiabatic means no heat, no entropy. P over rho to the gamma equals constant. Got that copy in there. Okay. Um, where am I for time? Mm, kind of slow. How is that there already? It's not always, when you look at a piece of paper like this, it's not always obvious how long it's going to take me to get through this piece of paper. It throws off my planning. Okay, so adiabatic, this is an important bit, and that was a little bit of lecture that I'm not going to ask you to reproduce. You, you will be able to reproduce that when, by the time you're done and you've taken thermo, but because this isn't a thermo class, I just need the results. Okay, so what are we going to do today? Next. We're going to talk about linearization of stuff. So I'm going to talk kind of in general. The book just says, here's thermo. Here's linearized sound waves. He doesn't really talk about, he kind of skips over what he means by linearization and stuff. So I've got a function f of some quantity q. I don't know what q is. Maybe it's density. Maybe it's the number of cats that I have visited that day. I don't know. Um, Q could be all kinds of stuff. And it is equal to Q dot. There are more generic, more useful equations. This is just kind of a random ass equation that I can just write down. So I have some weird function of Q, and it is equal to its time derivative. This kind of thing shows up a lot. So there's other ways to do it. I'm using this particular example as, I'm using this particular equation as an example for the process. So I'm going to go through a process of linearizing this equation and making it simpler and turning it into an oscillator because that's what we do. So one of the things that I also know so I have an equation. Have an equation. That's the first step. The second step is I have one solution. Now this could be a stupid solution. I like stupid solutions. Stupid means it's easy to data lay. Um, uh, so I have a solution. And maybe it's the equilibrium solution. And maybe it is at this point q dot is zero. And I know that. But we'll just run with this anyway. So at Q0, I know what the solution is. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, close to Q0, what does the solution look like? But I don't know what F is. F could be horrible. It could be tangent to the secant. It could be something really nasty. 
Um, it could be something that you can only define by an interval. What it needs to be able to do is you have to be able to differentiate it. So as long as I can take a Taylor series, I'm, in, I'm set. And even though this might not be a thing that I can solve at all, uh, I can at least get an approximate solution. So we're going to get approximate solutions using the Taylor series. I didn't really understand the Taylor series when I first learned it. Not going to lie to you. I thought it was really dumb. Because you have a function, and then you can write that function as a much more complicated function. Didn't make any sense to me. Until I realized that that much more complicated function actually gets really easy. So you got some function f of x. Well, I'll use a q. The Taylor series is what? The sum on d n f dq times q to the n over n factorial. Is that right? For a Taylor series? I'm pretty sure that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, this is horrible, but 1 plus q is not horrible, because what this does is it, make, is it turns things into lines. F around q naught is f at q naught. Let's rewrite this. So when I do a Taylor series, f at q naught plus q1, where q1 is small. So sometimes when you see this linearization, people will use delta q. I'm going to use q naught and q1 for the symmetry of it. But q1 is small. mean by small? We'll leave it at small for now. So f of q naught plus q1 is equal to f of q naught plus q1 times df dq at q naught. This is a number, not a function. It might be a horrible number to get, but it's a number that I can get. And q1 is just the thing that, that I care about. So on the right, on the left hand side, this is something horrible. On the right hand side, this is just a line. This is just mx plus b. mx plus b. So we're just going to make everything look like that with my generic equation. So how do I how do I use that to make this equation look like something useful? So the first thing I'm going to do is take a Taylor series of the left hand side around q1, or around q0. So we're going to start with this. We're going to expand it around q0. So that's what the Taylor says. Let's erase that. I don't care about that for a second. So f of q naught plus q1 equals q naught dot plus q1 dot. I haven't done anything interesting here. I've just written down this, replacing q with q naught plus q1. So this is a value that's close to a value that I do care about. So if I Taylor series this, then I'm left with f at q naught plus q1 times df dq evaluated at q0 equals q0 dot plus q1 dot. Does that make sense? So I just Taylor series this guy. Excuse me. Then I have the fact that this is true. So this guy cancels this guy. And I'm left with q1, this is a variable that I'm interested in, times f prime of q0. This is a number that I can sort out however I sort that out, equals q1 dot. This is an equation that everybody here can solve now. You see that? Because I've got, let me rewrite it, ax equals x dot. What is x? I'm going to let you guys ruminate on this one for a while. It's a thing that it's equal to its own derivative. What's equal to its own derivative? e to the a times something. Uh, when I differentiate it, I bring down a 1 over a so that, I, that goes to the other side. Does that make sense? Oh.
Derp. No, you were right, Derp. Nathan. X equals e to the at. I differentiate this. X dot equals a e to the at equals a n. Right. Okay. So I can solve that. Okay, now I'm just going to deal with q's and stuff. So now q1 is equal to just q naught e to the f prime of q naught t. And I'm done. I have a solution. Even though I told you that I don't really understand f or how to get things out of it or how to solve anything about it, if we linearize it, we turn it into something stupid, something that we can deal with. This is an exponential. What if I had a second derivative here? Well, the process is the same, but I get a different equation here. But what's the difference for that? The only difference there is I get maybe an i. Because then it's going to oscillate. Because e to the i x equals cosine x plus i sine x. This is one of the coolest things that nature has given us. It's so useful. It's probably, I think that this is probably the most important equation that has ever been written. I'm pretty sure. Because uh, Fourier transforms get you so much. The Fourier transform, you don't have only begun to realize how amazing a Fourier transform is. And we'll get to that in a second. Why am I talking about Fourier transforms? I was just talking about the stability analysis. Let's talk about Fourier transforms for a second, shall we? So I have a technique using Taylor series to take an equation that I, that I think is horrible and turn it into something that's linear that's going to give me an exponential or a sines and cosines. Because it's always going to do this. When I Taylor series this, I'm always going to get my variable times some number. That's how the Taylor series process works. So, uh, okay, so linearization. I'm going to come back to that in a second. We'll do this with sound waves um, in a second. Um, Fourier analysis is the other thing that I need to talk about. So if I have some function f, I can write this. As long as f is well enough behaved, that means it's continuous and differentiable. That's usually the answer. Although I'm realizing that everything is a fractal and nothing is differentiable. But that's another tiring. Okay, so if f of x is smooth and differentiable and nicely behaved and, you know, all the things that a mathematician, if you're in a math department, they're going to actually spend some time making sure all these things are true. In a physics department, we're just going to blindly use the Fourier transform and hope that it works and so we would get. So what this says is that the Fourier transform is equal to a1 times sine of x plus a2 times sine of 2x plus a3 sine of 3x, blah, blah, blah. And then you've got to do the same with cosines to be really general. So this is discrete. I'm never going to use the discrete version. I just write this down to get at what I'm going to write down. The thing that I'm going to use is ugly. No, it isn't. It's beautiful. <laughs> but it's complicated, and you have to understand it. This makes sense, right? This is I take some random ass function. I write it down as this collection of sines and cosines. Another way to do that, which you may or may not have seen it this way, but I'm going to show it to you this way. This is equal to the integral. This is discrete. We're going to use whatever wave number I want of, OK, sines and cosines. That's e to the i kx. There's a minus sign there. That doesn't really matter. Sometimes there's a 2 pi here. I don't like the 2 pi, but a lot of times people do like the 2 pi just depends on how you define k. So uh, um, so basically, the relationship between x and k, if there's a 2 pi or not, it really just changes the units, the, or the scale. It doesn't really change anything. So I don't need a 2 pi here, but you may have seen one. I'm going to skip it because the math all works the same. dk, we're adding up things in k, and our amplitudes of each sine and cosine is f hat of k. So e to the ikx is sine and cosine, right? Everybody happy with that? Mm -hmm. This is how much of which one of these I have. 
So this is the amplitude. So this relationship, this is the Fourier transform. I can go the other way, f hat of k equals the integral of f of x e to the plus i k x dx. So the one transform integrates over k, the other transform integrates over x. One transform takes the k thing as an argument and gives you the x thing. The other one takes the x thing as an argument and gives you the k thing. So these guys undo each other. And somewhere along the way, you should prove that this is true. Yeah. So in this relationship, k is like the frequency, and f hat of k is function of frequency? Or is it something? Yeah, like this is how much of this. It's, it's how much you have is the amplitude at each wave vector, or at each wave number. So uh, it's also another way to represent this guy. So these two things are actually equivalent uh, representations of the same object. But one is in Fourier space and the other one's in real space. A huge amount of the confusing, weird-ass things that you're going to run into, especially when you get to quantum mechanics, all comes from this relationship. All of the weird quantum mechanics business is all because Fourier transforms win. Um, and Fourier transforms are incredibly powerful. Also, it's a very limited worldview because it's all the math that we've done. But, but um, so the Fourier transforms are super powerful. So, so if we do the same thing that we did before, oh, another important thing, the important thing that I want to talk about um, is if I take the derivative of f of x with respect to x. I'm going to put the derivative here. It's going to come inside. The derivative of f of k with respect to x is what? Is everybody here? Zero. So this doesn't depend on k, or of, of x. It only depends on k. The only x dependence is in here, and it's only here. So if I differentiate this, this is equal to the same thing f hat of k times minus i k times e to the minus i k x dk. So differentiation turns into multiplication when you change from real space to Fourier space. And the other way around, too. So if you have a differential equation that you don't know how to solve, you can put it in Fourier space, and it becomes something that's very easy to solve. For instance, the Poisson equation. Del squared phi equals rho. Maybe there's some four pi's, or maybe there's an epsilon naught. So maybe this is gravitational potential, or maybe this is electric potential. Either way, this is hard to do in real space. But in Fourier space, phi hat equals k, k to the minus 2 times rho. Because this is this del squared turns into just a k squared. So this is much easier. This is just multiplying. It's easier to solve. So Fourier transforms make things easier to solve. They give us insights. We're going to play with them. And one of the things that it does is it makes a physicist kind of lazy. And I'm going to say, and the book says, and other books will say, assume that I can say that my density is equal to i k x minus omega t. So there's a lot of times when you're reading physics textbooks that this kind of thing, they just say, let's just assume we can do this. It's not an assumption. You can always do this. It's a thing you get to do. But when they say, we're just going to assume this, they're burying a bit of math. And I'll show you that bit of math, and then we'll We'll bury it too because it's frankly easier to just say, I'm just going to use a Fourier mode because I know it's going to work. I'll talk about that in a second. So, uh, let's see. What else did I want to say about Fourier transforms? Does anybody have any questions about Fourier transforms before I start using them? Let's see. Oh, uh, yeah. So, K and X are conjugate pair. 
when I Fourier transform k, I get x. Omega and t are a conjugate pair. If I Fourier transform some time signal, I get something in the frequency domain. The beauty and the power in physics is that k is momentum. Omega is energy. This is this will make everything make more sense when you get to quantum mechanics. But anyway, we're going to skip that now. So, quantum mechanical things, that's true. Um, uh, that's everything on that piece of paper. Okay. Got ten minutes left. I got to go quick. I was going to do sound waves today. Uh, let's start sound waves. So, okay, so we're going to use these tools. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to, or the next thing we're going to do is we're going to get sound waves. So we start with Euler, d by dt of rho plus div rho v equals zero, and continuity, d by dt of v plus v dot grad v equals minus 1 over rho grad p, and we'll ignore viscosity for now. And I said those backwards. If anybody was paying attention, that was not on purpose. Uh, I just realized after I started calling this one continuity, it was totally wrong. This is continuity, and this is Euler. OK, what we're going to do We're going to linearize both of them. We're going to cross differentiate and combine to get one equation. Then we're going to do some Fourier analysis. Of what we get out, and then we'll have a sound wave. All right, so let's start with continuity. So we're going to say that rho not our background density that we know we'll have a solution for is rho not and it's constant. P not is constant in space. V not is zero. So this is a bottle of gas that's just sitting there not doing anything, totally homogeneous. That's a boring solution. I put these in here, and I get 0 equals 0. It's not very interesting. But we can linearize around a boring solution and ask what the solution is for rho naught plus rho 1, where rho 1 is small. So we'll just take rho naught plus rho 1 and v naught. Uh, let's just call it v1. I'm going to skip that step and p naught plus p1. We'll drop them into these two equations. We're going to throw out all the small things, and then we're going to, we'll, then we're going to drop in some Fourier modes. All of this math that I'm spending most of this today's lecture on is actually like two lines in every textbook that you read when they do this. Like linearize and Fourier, and then you have this other stuff. So this becomes routine once you've done it a couple of times. So OK, into here d by dt of rho naught plus rho 1 plus div rho naught plus rho 1 times v1. We'll say that v naught is 0, right? OK, that equals 0. Let's simplify and collect some terms. So I've got d by dt of rho naught plus, let's expand this. This is rho naught v1 plus rho 1 v1 plus uh, sorry that goes to zero for a dumb reason um, let me do it sorry I know you just wrote all that down I'm doing this a little slightly differently let's say that v is v naught plus v one v naught is going to be zero in a second but I want to do I want to leave it there for a second 
So d by dt of rho naught plus rho one equals, uh, no, plus div rho naught plus rho one times v naught plus v one. We expand this out, we get rho naught v naught, that's our original term, plus rho naught v one plus rho 1 v naught plus rho 1 v 1 did all this. So this term, this term and this term, oh man, those are almost the same color. These two guys are my background solution, so I know that they add up and make zero. Where you go. So I'm left with dt of rho 1, okay, that's what I like, rho naught times v1 plus div rho naught v1 plus rho 1 v naught, v naught is 0, so that goes away, and rho 1 v run is small, so I'm going to throw it out. So, uh, so I want this one, that guy is 0. This one is too small. Throw it out. How do I know it's too small? Because it has two ones. There are many ways to do this, and to, many ways to teach this. And a lot of times people will say that row one is epsilon times some other number, and v one is epsilon times some other number. So this is epsilon squared. So if epsilon is 10 to the minus 3, epsilon squared is 10 to the minus 6. I can usually ignore that. So this term I throw out. And I'm left with just these two terms, rho 1 and div rho naught v1 equals 0. Wait, I'm going to put this up here. d by dt of rho naught plus div rho naught v1 equals 0. I'm going to erase some stuff. We'll do the same thing with Euler. So we're still on the linearized stage. So if d by dt, I'm going to skip v naught for now. v1 plus v1 dot grad v1. It should be v naught plus v1 dot grad v naught plus v1, but we're just going to throw out the v naughts for a second. So this is just v1 times v1. Two ones, I'm going to throw this guy out because it's two small things. Equals minus 1 over rho plus naught plus rho 1 grad p naught plus p1. Okay, so this term, small. There's two perturbations. This one, 1 over rho naught plus rho 1. Okay, 1 over rho naught times 1 over 1 plus rho 1 over rho naught. The only reason I write it this way is because I know what the Taylor series of 1 over 1 plus x is off the top of my head. That is equal to 1 over rho naught times 1 minus rho 1 over rho naught. A lot of work for a term that I'm going to throw out in a second, but we've got to do it anyway. You've got to know why you get to throw it out. So throwing out things in physics is great as long as you have a good reason. Um, so that's this term. That hits this term, which is p naught plus p one. Well, grad p naught is zero because it's constant. There's other ways you could do that. It goes away in other ways. So grad p one goes away, or grad p one is part of my background solution, and I know that that goes away anyway. So this term goes away, and so I'm left with that. So we're left with just. So the right hand side is just one over rho naught times grad p one from this term, minus 1 over rho naught, rho 1 over rho naught grad p1. And this goes away because I got a rho 1 and a, rho, and a p1. So this is two small things, so we throw it out. So my linearized Euler's equation is d by dt of v1. This is a minus sign that I keep dropping. There's a minus sign there, there's a minus sign there. We'll pull that to the other side. Plus 1 over rho naught grad p1 equals 0. These are my linearized Euler equations. 
How do how can I tell? I mean, they look basically like the regular equations, right? But they're linearized because I only ever have one interesting variable at a time in any one of these terms. The other ones are not interesting variables. Rho naught is not an interesting variable. It's just a number that I started with. P1 is the interesting variable. That's what I care about. So, how am I for time? Oh. I actually ought to stop, but I'm going to finish it for completeness. Because it's only going to take me a second. Um, okay, so now I have these two two equations. I want one equation. Let's get rid of velocity. Oh, oh crap! I still got this p. Let's get rid of that. One over rho naught grad p one. Okay, here's the physics. And again, the book kind of glosses over this interesting physics here. I'm going to assume that my process is adiabatic. What that means is that there's no entropy flow. It also means that there's no heat flow. It also means that P is only a function of density. That means I can use chain rule to completely replace pressure with density. And I'll just replace this with 1 over rho naught dP d rho grad rho. If it's not adiabatic, I can't do that because when I chain rule this, I get another term that depends on the temperature. Chain rule has a couple of terms usually. When it, if you have a couple of variables, chain rule spits out a couple of terms. Because it's adiabatic, pressure and density depend on only each other and don't care about anything else. So I can say this. I'm going to call this. Uh, uh, I'm going to call this square. For now. I'm not going to call it anything. Square is dp d rho. And then I'll show you what square is in a second. Uh, okay, now I've got rho. So now I'm set. Okay, now cross differentiate. So I'm going to take this time derivative of the first one and the space derivative of the second one, and I'm going to subtract. So that means that this term turns into a grad of d by dt of d by dx of rho naught v1. I'm going to take the space derivative of this, and I'm going to also get d by dt of d by dx of rho naught times v1. There's a rho naught here. It'll go over here. So we're going to kill this term and this term. We're going to be left with this term and this term. I'm just going to do that because I'm actually out of time. d squared rho 1, take the time derivative of this guy, subtract the time, the space derivative of this guy, minus c squared del squared of rho 1 equals 0. Now this is a wave equation. Now we take all the, the I'll do this again on Thursday slower. Um, uh, now we take our Fourier transform. Now we assume that rho 1 is equal to rho naught e to the i k x minus omega t. Now we have two dimensional Fourier transform, very similar to a one dimensional transform. We just have two variables. Now, one way to say it is I'm just going to say as an ansatz that this is what I'm doing. That's not true. What I'm doing is a bunch of math, and I get to do this because this is the right thing to do. It's not anything that I'm making up. There's lots of math behind this uh, that I'll show you in a second, or I'll show you on Thursday. Right now, I'm just going to drop this in, and because of this, the time deriv the second time derivative of this guy is just minus omega. So this second time derivative just turns into minus omega squared because I bring down an i times omega for both time derivatives times rho 1. And then this term uh, gets a k squared, minus k squared. Because if I take a space derivative of this, I bring down an i k. So I bring down a minus k, so that makes me a plus k squared, times what did I call this? Square equals 0 times rho 1. Now we assume that rho 1 is, zero, is not 0. And we're left with this equation. Omega squared 
equals square times k squared. This is this thing. It's the derivative of pressure with respect to density. But I can see from here that this is the speed of the wave. Omega over k is a velocity. And I'll talk about wave and group speed next time. But omega over k is the speed of the wave. And this is what I called square a second ago. It is equal to d uh, p over d rho. Square root of that because square. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions on anything that I just said? Pretty good so far. I'm going to do it again a little slower, the second part on Thursday. Uh, thanks for sticking around. We went over by a couple of minutes. Um, but now, now you have seen sound waves.